in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word this evening um, and to gather with those who will watch this later. Uh, open our hearts and minds this evening to look at some of the parts of Scripture that are, are a little hard for us to read until those moments when they're exactly the words that are in our heads. And even then, we aren't sure how to pray them. So open our, our hearts and minds tonight and these coming weeks to, to understand your prayer book that you have given your church. And that means all of them, even the ones that are hard for us to, to hear ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the imprecatory psalms um, are not the psalms that we normally uh, hear about uh, necessarily, uh, because again, they are they are difficult. Um, trying to find a list because I do not have all of these memorized without uh, looking at a cheat sheet. And of course, the first list I look at doesn't have it. Oh, yeah, they do. Okay, this this will just give you a, a start. So imprecatory psalms are psalms like 137 we're going to look at tonight, um, 35, 58, 69, 83, 109. What came after 69? Uh, 83 and 109. Thank you. Okay, so they're going to be quite a bit different from the the Psalms of Thanksgiving, which you can look at them and instantly go, okay, I'm, I'm thanking God in every verse. You know, we kind of get what that is about. Or the uh, penitential Psalms that we read uh, around Advent or Lent, uh, where we're lamenting our sin, uh, particularly you know, Psalm 51, the one we, we sing every Sunday. Uh, you know, creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, cast me not away from thy presence. So those, we kind of know how to pray those. We know that those are our prayers. Those are words that we have in our hearts. Uh, even, him, uh, even Psalms of lament, which is about a third of them, is lamenting this or that thing that has happened. But imprecatory, that's different. That's calling on God to bring his wrath upon someone. That one we're maybe not so comfortable with. Like, well, okay, so we're actually calling on God to curse someone to judge them, to destroy your enemies. Like, wow, that seems kind of harsh. Uh, what, what are we supposed to do with that? Are we really supposed to be praying these? Are these just for the people in the Old Testament? And they're, of course they're not. Gave, God gave us all scripture. All scripture is useful for reproof, for reproach, for learning. Uh, so, so even these have a purpose. But what is the purpose is if you look in the front of our hymnal, which does not have all 150 of them because they need space for everything, so they make choices, I bet you're not going to find the imprecatory psalms in there. Uh, so, so what are they for? Uh, because the language is shocking. Um, again, like I said, until those are the words that you're actually feeling. So uh, when we have uh, big events that happen, 9-11, uh, for example, all of a sudden, yeah, we were very angry at a certain portion of the world. Uh, this virus, we're angry at somebody. I don't know who exactly, but we're angry at different groups for doing or not doing different things. Um, and we just don't know what, how are we supposed to, to use these, these psalms? I'll just give you a little bit, uh, a couple of verses of the language they're using, particularly the one we're going to look at tonight. Psalm 69 says... You know, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Okay, that's pretty clear. You know, you just asked for some group of people to be, you know, not alive and to be not counted among God's elect. And then the one we're going to look at tonight, O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. That makes sense. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. Maybe a little harder to read that. Um, then Psalm 58, O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. Let the grass, like grass, let them be trodden down and wither. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. 
like the untimely birth that never sees the sun. I mean, what, that one's just dreadful, the imagery that we're seeing there. That's Psalm 58. So with knowing that this is the canonical scripture, this is the inspired word of God, well, what, what are we supposed to do with this language? You know, and doesn't Jesus teach us how to behave in a way that's slightly the opposite of what these psalms are saying? But these psalms are about vengeance. These songs are about retribution. And we feel those emotions sometimes. So ultimately, when we realize that this is the prayer book God gave for us, there must be something God is asking of us to do with these emotions and these feelings and these desires. And ultimately... Uh, it's the same as all the other psalms, which ultimately we're going to see, well, we are supposed to put these feelings, put this burden of vengeance and revenge, put it on God. That's what prayer does. It takes your problems and makes them God's problems because that's what he expects. That's what he wants. So if I lay this burden on God, well, now it's not my burden anymore. My burden is, is lifted, and that's what we'll see with these. Um, but that is really the why and the how and the what for of all of these. Uh, but the language is, is uh, coarse at the very least, um, maybe even a little presumptuous that, okay, God immediately is on my side and he's going to take care of this little problem for me. So we'll take a closer look. So if you look at, at Psalm 137, who feels like reading tonight? Anyone? Emily always feels like reading. Go ahead. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we present, remembered Zion on the willows there, we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs. And our tomorrows, our captors, mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem. How they said, lay it there, lay it there, down to its foundation. O daughter of Babylon, Doomed and destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Okay, short and sweet and not all that friendly. But there are uh, three parts to this and we'll look at the three parts uh, in detail. Uh, but looking at the... Um, the opening of this song, there's a couple things we should keep in mind. Uh, many times in the people of God's history, they were taken against their will and they were enslaved. Uh, they were exiled. They were not allowed to come home. Uh, and that was the same thing in the 6th century. So the 6th century began on January 1st, the year 600-ish, and then uh, went on until the end of the year 501, right, the end of the year 501. So the 6th century BC uh, was the Babylonian captivity. So the people of Israel were captured by the Babylonians after being defeated uh, militar militarily, which of course is a hardship for anyone to be, to be captured and taken from their land. But then when you consider, okay, the people of Israel Abraham's descendants, the people who were given this land, this is the land that I have you know, separated out for you, and now they have been plucked out of that land. So Jerusalem, the holy city, is conquered, basically destroyed. So that's Zion also, whenever you hear Jerusalem, Zion's the same place. Uh, and the Babylonians just humiliated them, okay? Their, their captors tormented them, they were mocked. Uh, they were forced to adopt the ways of the new area, including their religion, to reject the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And this psalm was written in the context of all of that suffering. 
Uh, so it is full of that, that sound of, of suffering people, but you also hear the anger. Okay, you hear how he wants, how David wants to return home, but he also is calling down those curses on the people that took them captive. So that's why this falls under that category of imprecatory, a psalm that calls for judgment of uh, your enemies. And it has these three parts. The first part is longing for home, verses 1 through 4. You're longing for home and your spirit is crushed. And then there's a warning to the psalmist, the warning to himself before he gets to the third part, which is the calling down the curse. He's got a warning to himself. And then, of course, the curse for the things, for the people who have captured him. So we look at uh, verses 1 through 4 first. Um, I'll just read those real quick again. Okay, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it we hung our harps, for there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Okay, so they're already, they're tormenting these people. It's like, okay, hey, we've heard about you Jews, and we know about your songs. Sing us a couple songs for us. They're, they're taunting them. Okay, let's hear these, these songs. Well, I don't think you really are going to like the song I'm going to play for you today. Too much, buddy, but here we go. So you have the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers that flow through Babylon. So two of the great rivers that flew, uh, flowed through Eden. So you have the, the two rivers that actually make this a livable area. You know, the Tigris and the Euphrates are the two great rivers that makes this desert an oasis, an oasis in the middle of the desert, a very nice place to live, actually. But yet these people are sorrowful for being captured and, and gathered there. And we see, uh, we see sorrow and rivers in other places. Uh, if we look at Acts 16.13 real quick, you're going to see the same situation. So Acts 16.13 says, uh, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. And a woman named Lydia from a city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And uh, when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. So this coming at the Sabbath day to the river, the side of the river, that, that's where you see worship take place. So that was a normal kind of a place for worship to be taking place. Uh, that's where John the Baptist did his thing in the Jordan, uh, on, the, on the side of the Jordan River. So prayer and sitting at the riverside is, is in their DNA. This is, where you, this is where you come to worship. And we see the same thing. They're trying probably to do the same thing in Babylon. They're at the side of the river. They've got their harps. They're ready to play. They're ready to worship. But it's not in them. It's not in them to do it. And then you have these people taunting them with it because they know that's why they're there. So that's, to begin with, not a very nice thing. So what other reasons do they have for being sad or for being so sorrowful, for being so angry? You know, what, what are all the things that are going going wrong in their lives right now that's brought them to this where they don't even want to sing. They don't even want to play their songs. Well, they've been removed from their homeland. Right. They've been basically told your style of worship is no longer violent. Right. And I believe when the Babylonians came in and took over, Right, I think they desecrated the temple to all the artifacts with them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the table of showbread and the, the ark. And 
right? Candelabra. Yep, so they took everything out, all the signs and symbols, everything that made church church for them, and they desecrated it. And now they're kind of mocking them with it because, okay, here they are. When you don't have a temple, you have a riverside, and they're there to sing, and they're like, oh, yeah, we heard about you guys, so let's hear, let's hear one of those, yeah. right? You know, so their entire culture has been turned upside down. Kind of like us today with Going around. Oh, exactly. It's kind of why I picked this one, too, because it's like, okay, well, by the way, well, we're not going to say you can't gather, but we're saying you maybe shouldn't for a while, so, and everybody starts doing something different. Um, I don't know how it is in other churches, but in the Missouri Synod, for good or bad, the congregations are independent. So we all fly under one confession of faith, but each church is independent. Okay. Synod, the Synod can only tell us what they recommend. So like, well, we recommend you guys do this. So we have, you know, synod, and then each district, and then each district has circuits. Okay. And then, so I have my little circuit that's got like eight churches in it of eight other guys that we all meet with. But at the end of the day, our congregation decides what it wants to do on its own. You know, we're independent. They can't tell us what, what to do. Uh, so now you've got umpteen thousand Lutheran churches throughout the country all doing different things because everybody's doing what they think is best for them. And of course, this one thinks he's doing it right. I think I'm doing it right. They think they're doing it right. And of course, these people in your congregation think you're doing it wrong. So everybody's mad at everybody else, you know, forgetting kind of why we come here for what we want. So then you look at these, these uh, Babylonian exiles down by the riverside. Well, they're down by the riverside because it takes 10 Jewish men to have a synagogue. You gotta have 10. They don't even have 10. So they're down by the river doing what they can do. And there, there's no songs of joy there. There's only, only these tears. And then this, this taunt, uh, the tormentor's mirth saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. That's not an arbitrary phrase. The songs of Zion is another phrase you can use for this book, the, the Psalter. So the Songs of Zion is referring specifically to these 150-some prayers. Uh, so it's not even, it's a very specific taunt. You know, it's, it's very pointed right at them for, okay, well, let's hear you pray to your God. Uh, so they're asking for something totally inappropriate. You know, they want to hear this for the show, the, spec the spectacle, the making the people they're going to force to sing them uncomfortable, whatever. Uh, so using God's word to mock God is obviously arrogant, inappropriate, uh, and that is probably not going to, in the end, turn out well. Because uh, it's a vehicle for worship. It's, that's what these prayers are for. Uh, the, the tradition is that Jesus prayed all 150 from the cross. And the, the words from the cross we heard are just the ones we heard, that he would have prayed through all 150. And I, I like that tradition. I think that's probably very, very possible that he did that. I mean, they're about him, <laughs> so why wouldn't he? Uh, and again, it's the, the words he was given to pray, um, that he gave them to us. So they've got that against them, too. They've got their way of worship being mocked. And then the psalmist changes, changes his tone. Okay. He, he laments about what's going on and what's happening to them here on this day. But then he says, well, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You know, how could we do that? How can we, how can we sing? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So he's even saying, well, if I forget where we came from, I forget where home is, if I don't remember that, then let, let me forget all my skill as a musician, as a leader of the people, as a, even as a uh, somewhat of a priest in David's case. So let him forget all of that if he forgets where he comes from. And that is his warning to himself. That is the 
part where he's going, okay, this is what I cannot do. Uh, like it's the Hebrew literally, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, uh, literally forgetting its skill, that phrase literally means my hand become numb and un paralyzed, unable to function. So it's not just let my hand forget its skill, let my hand become dead, basically. Uh, and that his tongue cling to the roof of his mouth, that he'd be unable, unable to speak. So here, uh, there is this contrast between the words remembering and forgetting. If I forget the Lord, may I not remember how to function, basically. Um, I guess we could ask the question, who's doing the remembering and who's doing the forgetting? So David's obviously the one's concerned about forgetting, but who's the one that's actually doing the remembering? He's talking to Jerusalem, which he's not actually talking to the city. Who's he talking to? Yeah. No. The whole point of the Psalms is talking to who? God. Talking to God for prayers. Okay. So when he says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, okay, yeah. Then may my, then my may my members not remember how to do anything. Mm -hmm. So he's calling on God's memory here. You know, God, don't forget us either. Uh, and I'm maybe stretching the point a little bit. Uh, you know, when you think about the thief on the cross, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, it's always God doing the remembering. It's not really us doing the remembering. You know, even, even when Jesus says, you know, take, eat, take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. You know, it's not in remembrance of him giving them bread and wine. It's in remembrance of what he's about to do the next day. You know, it's always pointing back to the cross for us, back to the cross for the children of Israel, forward to the cross. So, you know, he, he puts that, that little remembrance thing there, don't forget. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget who got you out of trouble before. You know, God always rescues his people. You know, don't give up on that trust ultimately. But then he goes into the hard part, which is why we're here. Uh, and the importance, of course, of not reading things out of context. So, so he addresses himself. First, he warns himself not to forget, not to forget, you know, all the things that God has taught them, you know, not to forget how he has rescued them before. But now he, he you know, calls on God to strike these people down. And that's, that's kind of hard. So if you look at, there's various other places too, um, in the Bible that, that focus on this exact, uh, exact situation. So we look at, at 7 and 9, it, it talks about, okay, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its foundation. All right, uh, in Joel thirteen nineteen, Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of the violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. And then uh, in Obadiah 8, uh, 10 and 11 and part of 15. In that day declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you'll be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On that day, you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. As you have done it, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. So David is asking God to remember what he did with the Edomites. And then it goes on. Then he turns to the Babylonians. O oh, daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. 
Uh, for that, we should probably look at actually what the Babylonians actually did. We have to look at 2 Kings 25. And that's a long one, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, 2 Kings 25. Last chapter of 2 Kings. And this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, besieging Jerusalem. Let's see. Now in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month. I love how they add these details mm -hmm. and stuff. And then as we discover more things archaeologically, like it seems like every week you can read a new article. It's like, oh, they like found such and such or so and so. Oh, and, oh by the way, this guy was a real guy. And it's like, you know, just like it says in the Bible. It's like, oh, how about that? <laughs> but more and more, more and more, they're finding more and more of this stuff that just corroborates all these details and dates. Like, why do they have all that in there? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came. He and all his army against Jerusalem camped against it and built a siege wall all around it, which is no small undertaking to build an entire wall around a walled city. Uh, so the city was under siege until the 11th year of King uh, Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city was broken into. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city was broken into, and all the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls beside the king's garden though the Chaldeans were all around the city. And they went by way of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and he passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the King of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Even every great house he burned with fire. So all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Then the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon and the rest of the people, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorer of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Now the bronze pillars which were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea which were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. They took away the pots, the shovels, the snuffers, the spoons, and all the bronze vessels which were used in temple service. And it goes on a great deal from there. And took Sariah, down in verse 18, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, with the three officers of the temple. From the city he took one official who was overseer of the men of war, and five of the king's advisors who were found in the city, and the scribe of the captain of the army who mustered the people of the land and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. Nebers Zeradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. Then the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was led away into exile from its land. So that you know, is pretty descriptive, pretty specific. All of the things they did to desecrate the temple and to destroy Jerusalem. So this is no small thing that they're upset about. You know, this is their home was destroyed completely, carried away. And now you know, Babylon is just sitting on top. But um, they've got the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. So you've got two armies. And basically they're better off with the Babylonians than with the Chaldeans. Is kind of the short summary of this. Uh, so yeah, it's not good, but it could be worse. Is kind of the little bit of the takeaway from this, which is a 
a gross understatement of what's going on. Uh, but we've only got so much time to go over this. So yeah, they're, they're still calling down God's wrath on these people that took them captive. And then we come to verse 9. This whole thing about, okay, well, let's, well, let's make sure all the babies of our enemies are you know, killed and good for the people who carry it out. So that's probably the worst part of this psalm. So we can understand, okay, let's call God's judgment down on this foreign army that captured us. But, but killing their children? I mean, we would never do that in warfare today. You wouldn't do it. You just wouldn't do it. It'd be, you know, immoral. It'd be unthinkable. So why would we say something like that? Uh, first off, in the ancient world, violence against children was not unthinkable. That was that was something that happened in war. Um, so we probably have a little bit of trouble wrapping our minds around that. But that that is that was the way warfare worked back then. Uh, you can look at Nahum three ten for another example of that. Yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. So that's another example. That's the kind of thing that happened in warfare uh, then. And again, we end, that's the end of the psalm. So we're like, okay, what... what what are we taking away from this? Because this is not any better after we look at the history and see what the historical context is. This is not any better. What are we supposed to do with this psalm? Okay, well, let's back up to where the psalmist writes, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Okay, so the temple's in Jerusalem. The temple is no more. Jerusalem is no more. It's basically been destroyed. They're in a foreign land. Well, where are you supposed to sing God's songs when you don't have a temple? What are they to do? And for the Jews, that's a legitimate question. What are we supposed to do? The temple is gone. That, I mean, when the temple was destroyed in 70, that threw them for a complete loop. They, the, the sacrificial system ended. They still, to this day, don't kind of know what they're doing with some stuff because the, the temple's gone. What do they do? Pray. Pray. Right. I think in the case here, the first part, the longing for home mm -hmm. by singing some of the songs. This one and some of the other ones where they're praising God is like you said, pray, it's also keeping the focus right. on God. On God, exactly. And, if, Good. and realizing that yeah, it's our fault we're here. Mm -hmm. But like so many times in the past, it mentioned God has always restored them. So by and yeah, it was a, an affront for them to sing a song in a foreign land, but I think keeping it in their hearts and their memories right. it keeps the focus on God wherever they, wherever they were at. Yeah, exactly. Now you look at you look at Jesus with, I think it was at the end of Jesus with the woman at the well. So I think that's John 4. I gotta look. Some guys just have all this stuff I do not. <laughs> yeah, it's the woman at the well from uh, the Samaritan woman at the yeah. well, John 4. So near the end, this is one of those verses that we kind of skip over because the point of the story kind of happened already. But then Jesus says some of the stuff that may be a little weird to our ears sometimes. Jesus said to her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And then the woman says, well, I know the Messiah is coming. And then Jesus drops the bomb. Oh, yeah, I am he. Okay, it's like, wow. 
it's quite a day. Okay, so, you know, Jesus is speaking right to that. Like, of course, he's also predicting, does more than once, that the temple is going to be destroyed again in, in AD 70. And not one stone will remain upon another. But, you know, the time is coming where you're not going to worship the way you did. Uh, you're going to have to worship in a new way, but it's a way that he is showing them. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, which, of course, she doesn't get. Nobody gets that yet. Not yet, uh, but that's beginning. Um, that's, as I recall correctly, that is, that is Mount Horeb, right near where they are. So the Holy Mountain is, it's like Mount Horeb on one side, and the other side is like Sinai, but I don't think it's Sinai. I think it is Sinai. Sinai and Horeb, I think, are the same place. So that is like the Holy Mountain. That's like the Mountain of the Ten Commandments. Uh, And that's where you worship God. You know, it's when Moses went up to the yeah. top of the mountain. So it's also that place you have that. It's Horeb? Horeb. I get these mountains messed up, so don't quote me on that. I'm better off not saying things sometimes. Uh, and then if you look at the book of Revelation, because I love tying everything to the book of Revelation eventually. Revelation 21, 22. I do not see in a temple. I do not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Okay, so you won't need a temple anymore because you've got Jesus. You know, we don't need these trappings and all the bronze, cool stuff, and all the gold and the ark and everything else because Jesus is the ark. Uh, so ultimately, it's all going to come around to Him. And that is what David is looking forward to, always looking forward to the Messiah, really, uh, even though it's not explicitly said. But you know, looking for, okay, the way we, what we have to work with here is not great, but this is what we're going to deal with. And you look at what the Jewish people did after the Holocaust. They had to do the same thing. Yeah. You look at what the Christians had to do after World War II, okay? You know, there's pictures of like the bombed out cathedral in Dresden. And there's a priest standing there holding mass to an empty cathedral. Why, I don't know. But uh, things had to change because times of war. Okay, but still, okay, that's great. That's the Jewish people. We understand their culture and their plight at that time back then. Or, or, and even in, in the first century with what was happening with the Romans. But how, how about for us? You know, what are we supposed to do with those last three verses as Christians? How can the psalmist ask God to do these terrible, terrible things? I mean, are we supposed to forgive our enemies? What are we supposed to do here? Um, it seems to me that, because this has been a troubling one for me for, for years and years, um, the 7 through 9 are giving us permission to be upset and angry. Yes. Good, yeah. It's, it's because God created us human beings, He understands how we feel. And by voicing it, He can then heal that. He can then give us a sense of our heart for forgiveness. Good. It's real good. Yeah, that is one of the things that is interesting to watch a child struggle with when they're working through, you know, like the Ten Commandments or the, some of these accounts in the Old Testament. And children wonder, you know, the little bit older children that can articulate this stuff a little better, you know, just instinctually go, so is it a sin to be angry? And like, no, it is not a sin to be angry. You know, it's a, lots of things are a sin. Being ang righteously angry about something, of course not. It's not a sin. Jesus got angry. God got angry. God gets, <laughs> God gets very angry. Okay. Yeah, what do you do with it, though? or where do you put it? Well, what do you what do you do with it? What do you where do you put it? So you leave it to God to fix. That's exactly right. So let's look at a little New Testament. So Mark eleven twenty five and twenty six, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay, that makes sense. A little bit tough when I've been captured and my home has been razed to the ground and I have to live someplace else, but okay. 
And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. Then Matthew 18, 21, and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Because seven is a holy number. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. When Jesus really means 77 times? No, he meant infinity times. Okay, so, all right. Um... Great, so I know I'm supposed to feel this stuff. It's okay to feel it, and it must be okay to say it because God gave me the words to say these things back to God. You don't have to raise your hand, really? We're in school here. But the thing is, we give it to God, and on the judgment day, God will take care of the enemies and the sinners. Ooh, judgment day. Brings it right well, I mean, that's Nice, what we're yes. It over to. Yes, that's and exactly that's right. Weak. I like that. Yes. Okay. All right. And vengeance is mine, where we started. Did we start with that? I hope. Did I say that? Uh, maybe not. I don't know. I'll lead with that next time. Yeah, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay. So. But that doesn't mean you just. Doesn't mean you are the instrument of God's wrath. Right. So if you think you're the instrument of God's wrath, please go see a shrink. Because <laughs> no, no, you're not. And if you have anger, mm -hmm. and but the anger is not a sin, and that's no. the part we can't we can't divorce the feeling from the action. I think in our culture, because if you know what is one of our what is one of my favorite genres of movies is like you know like uh, action movies where okay, hero has been wronged, hero is going to go get vengeance, and he's going to kill everybody and it's going to be entertaining while he does it but because that's what we think i want revenge i take revenge i mean that's so imbued in our culture i don't think we know how to take that apart except theoretically anymore i think it's difficult when we are angry yeah to turn it into prayer yeah the first thing we think of is when we're angry is i want to Smack them up alongside them with two by four. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying that our movies and our media like foist this on us. We like it because that's how we are. If yeah. we didn't like it, we wouldn't pay for it and they wouldn't make it. Uh, but but that, that is the thing we have a hard time doing. It's like, okay, I've got this righteous anger about something and it's out of my hands. And so I'm just going to let it go. Like Sheldon with the pen that doesn't have your name on it. Did you get that one? Good. It's, nobody gets that reference when I use it. But, you know, take a nice, but not a nice pen with your name on it and let it go. So we have the hard time of letting that go. You know, especially in the worse of a transgression it is, the more we want to hang on to it like we can do something about it. And that's what these psalms are all about, is okay, have the righteous anger. Call on God and make it God's problem. You know, all you can, we easily make all our other problems God's problem. But this one might be tough, and maybe that's why these are hard to pray. Because we have trouble saying those words going, okay, now I want to go, like, dash their kids against a rock. No, I don't. But you can understand why they felt that way, why they would want to do that. But Romans twelve nineteen b it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Okay. Jeremiah eleven twenty, but O Lord Almighty, you who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. So that is where we wind up. It's like, okay, yes, it's for God to judge, it is for God to mete out justice. Uh, so you put that burden on him. The burden is on him to make it right. And since you know he's you know God, he will do this. And we are to have the trust and the faith that he will. So, yes, be angry. Yes, call down his wrath. But the calling down the wrath is not so you're vengeful, so that you are going to go out and do something violent. It is so that you can let that too go. Put that on him, and then guess what? You don't have to feel that way anymore. Easier said than done. You know, if, if someone comes and kills your whole family and burns your house down, I don't think the next morning you're going to exactly lay that on God and be okay with it. 
that is going to take a lot of time and healing. But that's the idea. That is the idea of this people that were pulled into exile for like the third or fourth time at this point. Everything they knew, fourth time, everything they knew is gone. And yet, how am I supposed to sing praises to the Lord? This is how. Lord, I'm angry, and I want these people destroyed, but that is your righteous justice in your time and in your way that's going to take care of this. I can't, because it will consume me, so I have to give it to you. That's what, we're, that's what they're doing in this one. And that's what we're going to find we do in all of them. But then the final question is, okay, well, that's all great, preacher man. But now in the real world, uh, you know, dealing with pain and suffering is not that easy. Okay, yeah, no, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, you know, it takes, uh, you don't just pray this one time and it goes away magically. Maybe for some people, maybe for some people they can. You know, I'm always, I had an interesting conversation with a pastor at the seminary. I think it was, it was either this past some fall or the fall before and he was talking about those ladies you see on TV when someone's kid gets wiped out by a drunk driver and they go on TV, I forgive you. And he's like, what are you forgiving him for? He's not sorry. You can't forgive someone that's not sorry. And he was like very, I'm like, holy cow. I've never thought of it that way before, but okay. There's always been something about that that bothers me. How do you forgive somebody that's not sorry for what they did? And I, that, that always kind of struck me. It's like, okay. Um, so how do we deal with human suffering and pain and evil? You know, we can talk about the argument from evil and be here for years because, you know, God exists even though evil exists. Sorry, uh, because we're sinful. But, but that, that letting go and that putting things back on God, that's what we're going to be looking at in the next couple of weeks. We're not going to dwell on this forever because, again, this is something I think you come back to. Once in a while, it's like, okay, I'm angry. How does God ask us to handle it in his word? And this is how, this is how, these are the prayers. Uh, but uh, you can look at the book of Lamentations, chapter one and two, uh, which specifically deals with this, this exile, this being t taken, torn from your home. That's what they are talking about in those two chapters. And it parallels Psalm 137 really nice, uh, really nicely. Um, and then you can look at Ezra and Nehemiah, and that shows you what it looked like when they came out of exile and they got home again. Uh, but, but dealing with, with pain and suffering, which we all deal with at some point, so what do we learn from this psalm that will help us deal with, with suffering, considering we are probably not going to be captured and, and taken from our homeland anytime soon? You know, I don't even know what that's like. Yeah, but we have the we have what we call the everyday suffering, which demeans it in a way because our everyday suffering for people is horrible, like losing a child or losing a job can be devastating, uh, is devastating to people. Um, there's all kinds of suffering that that we have. That we, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? And you know, someone well-meaning always puts their hand on your shoulder and says, well, put your trust in God and put it on him. But that's exactly what these say. That's exactly what they're telling us to do. So what we're going to look at, and probably in a little more coherent manner in the coming weeks, we'll look at how do we do that? How do we learn to, to let this stuff go and to truly put it on God so it's no longer on us? Which, again, is so easy to say because it's so easy for that well-meaning person to well, just... Put it on God and he'll handle it for you. Yeah, great. I know that. I know this to be true. But when it happens to you, for many people, that is not easy. It is not the easiest thing to do. Again, some people can just do it. Like, God bless them. That's awesome. I have, I, <laughs> boy, no. It's extra grace. God just must give them extra grace. Must be. Must be. Or maybe I'm the stubborn one, which is <laughs> the case, right? Because we like to fix it ourselves. And by this point now, I'm just rambling, so we'll probably stop it there for tonight. Any questions? This was kind of an impromptu 
throw it up there so they're usually more coherent than these but but uh, yeah we'll probably we'll probably look at a couple more precatory sums at least one more next week for sure we'll be doing this uh, But usually, usually when people do, and I, now I'm actually reading something another pastor prepared, talking about when he noticed when people were actually able to learn to pray these psalms, it's usually after something absolutely horrific happens, like uh, a member of your family is raped, you know, something violent like that. And they were like, Whoa, really, that is how people are learned how to pray these? And he said, yeah, they did. Because when you're feeling that high a level of emotion and rage, then you can kind of start to get what David was after. And you're like, oh, yeah, because all the stuff that happened to those guys is way less than what's ever probably going to happen to me. So I can see his point there. Uh, and he's watched people go through this. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see that that's really what it takes to actually understand some part of scriptures is you have to live what the people lived when they wrote it. Uh, and, there, and there's all kinds of examples of that. So we'll, we'll look some more at this in the next uh, couple weeks or so. And then we'll move back on to some of the more cheerful psalms. But I thought it would be good to look at these just because of all the stuff that's going on in the world right now across the board between this stupid virus thing and our stupid politics no matter whose side you're on and then the stupid things other countries do and <laughs> there's just so much stupidity in the world and it actually doesn't matter whose side you fall on because everybody can call the other guy stupid and it just seems like we're angry at everybody so sometimes sometimes you just want some of this stuff to be blotted out sometimes it's okay to pray that but like David, we have to look in that middle part, I think, is real important, where he stops and goes, okay, this is the warning to me before I get carried away with what I'm about to say, is remember where you came from, what God's done for you already, and then take another look. And is this really, really what you think you should be praying for? And if so, go for it. Uh, right, but then... Once you do that, remember it's not yours anymore. You, Let it yeah, go. You can't take it back. You have to leave it. Yeah, and I guess that's the next thing you pray for them is to help me to keep laying it on you because I keep wanting to take it back up oh, again. Yeah. So I, I just lay it there for you to pick up, and I know you got it, but I'm trying to take it away from you. Well, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can, can we all? It's like, you know, if you would have asked me, ugh, famous last words. All right, now I really am rambling, so we're gonna knock it off there for tonight. Unless you have any questions, comments. Pastor, I think you're crazy. Sometimes you got to say that too. Well, let's join together in the Lord's Prayer this evening. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.